We'd like to welcome everyone, all 26 of you. Yeah, that would be everyone, but we could probably have some more coming in in just a moment. Uh, this is a great, great panel. We're going to learn so much about uh, 3D ultrasound scanning and the positive incomes that can have for fertility treatments. But of course, we'd be nothing without our sponsors. So we do want to thank the folks from GE Ultrasound for supporting this entire conversation. Uh, they're the sponsor of this session. Is anyone from GE Ultrasound here? Well, see, we're really, really grateful. Shout out to the sponsors there in the back row. Thank you so much for your participation. And thanks to the audience. Uh, how many of you tweet? How many of you are social? How many of you do that sort of stuff? Anybody? All right, so let's just all remember hashtag FP. I believe that's Fertility Planet. We could probably think of some other acronyms, but that's FPLA14. 14. 14, I don't know. What, what's 14? Oh, I thought we're room number 14. Sometimes the obvious just goes whew, right over right over the head there. Uh, Facebook, you can actually even go to um, the website as well, which is Fertility Planet, spelled a unique way, P-L-A-N-I-T dot com, to get more information. Um, but my first job uh, here is to give you some wonderful information about the talented, wonderful, dynamic, intelligent, the adjectives can go on and on, doctor to my side. This is Dr. Hal Dancer, who's become a good personal friend of mine, um, as well as I'm not just a friend, I'm a, I'm a patient. I'm a patient, I'm a client, I'm all of that. But I, I have grown to love and admire and respect this man so much. And you will hear uh, him share some of his knowledge in a moment. But first of all, let me tell you, he's no stranger to UCLA. Uh, he has been working here and with the uh, Reproductive and Chronology and Infertility Fellowship Program here at UCLA. He's on the faculty and the staff. He's had numerous articles published. He's just one of the leading experts uh, in the field of fertility, founder and director and partner in the Southern California Reproductive Center, which if you are familiar with the centers around the country, it is really the leading center and the place to go, uh, not just here for uh, those of us lucky enough to live in the greater Los Angeles area, but people from around the country and around the world come. Uh, he's, I could go on and on, but I love this one too. He's also named one of the top 10 fertility specialists in the country by Parents Magazine. So, so there you have it, if Parents Magazine says, it's true, it must be. Uh, he's married to a, a psychologist, which I think must come in, uh, that must come in handy with all of the women that come through your office. <laughs> so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Dancer, to, uh, we're gonna share some stories, but first of all, we wanna give you some great information about this new kind of technology. I, I'm fascinated by this as well. I think that these ultrasounds, Doc, are getting a little freaky, to be honest. I mean, it's almost like you can completely, you know, have a conversation with the child. Once it goes along, I mean, you know, you can really get to know them. Exactly, but I, I, my girlfriend brought me up one the other day, and I'm like, that's, it was, it was unbelievable, unbelievable. But how is the practical application pre now? That's the thing that I think we're so fascinated about and what it can tell us. I think the unit evaluation quickly, <coughs> looking at couples that are going to be in that sort of IVR sort of mode, when you best time transfer the embryos so, so, so that you have good success. Uh, being able to diagnose problems that may um, occur in terms of getting pregnant. It's on. Is that better? No. Okay. <laughs> I think it works if you put it closer to your mouth. Okay, I think great. that. <laughs> All right. So, how many here are in the process of getting ready to get pregnant? How many have had uh, treatments, testing? Okay, so everyone's kind of familiar with some of the technology. You've had ultrasounds. Okay. Ultrasound, uh, well, let's start with the slides. We'll go through that, and then we'll have a chance to, to uh, field some questions so, so that you can better understand how this might be helpful in your individual situation. So, so ultrasound is, uh, is non-invasive, which is great. Um, uh, the applications are tremendous for gynecology, but certainly for in vitro fertilization. And everybody, is, well, not everyone, but people ask, you know, is it safe? Well, it's a very low energy way, so we don't have to worry about abnormalities of the baby or uh, issues with uh, problems with the ovary afterwards. You can have probably as many ultrasounds as you want to not affect your fertility. So 2D ultrasound, that's two dimensions, and that's flat. Uh, Traditional black and white were there for years, and now we've transitioned to 3D ultrasound, which uh, was able to happen because of computerization, and you can uh, get the software to kind of pile 2Ds on top of each other so you can get a 3D image. So 
not only get the, the two dimensions, height and uh, length, but you also get depth, which is very important when you're looking at a 3D structure like the uterus. So. It's been used to evaluate the uterus. There's some applications for the ovaries and even the fallopian tubes. But the main thing we look for is uh, fibroids of the uterus, polyps, uh, malformations of the uterus, and uh, you know, rarely cancer. Luckily, cancer is very rare in, in what we do. So. But the most important thing is that 3D ultrasounds uh, uh, have a more accurate way of evaluating the structure and the shape of the uterus. So this is, um, I, I know it kind of looks like gobbledygook, but it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm just going to point this, I'll move over here and point this out because everybody says, how can you tell what that is? <laughs> so uh, ultrasound is really looking at uh, bouncing this, uh, these energy waves off of structures, soft tissue. And x-rays don't show you soft tissue. They're great for bones, but they're, they, they can't tell anything about the uterus. So here's the uterus. You see that little speckled uh, appearance? That's the, the uh, muscle structure of the uterus. And then this bright area inside is actually the endometrial cavity which uh, has a very active tissue, and that's why it's brighter, so it's getting more echoes back. So we're looking at different slices through the uterus, uh, looking for fibroids, something that might be in the uterus, sometimes some glandular tissue. And then here we have the uterine cavity. Now here's the uterus, but this is the actual cavity of the uterus. And now you see something uh, projecting into the cavity of the uterus. It's a fibroid. They're not all quite that uh, pretty, but this is about uh, two, maybe three centimeters and it's pushing in into the cavity of the uterus. So uh, you don't want to try to put an embryo in here because uh, it may try to implant on the, on the fibroid. It may irritate the opposite wall. So this fibroid needs to be removed or before one would want to try to get pregnant. Even without in vitro fertilization, again, uh, this fibroid may grow with the pregnancy and cause miscarriage. Um, and this helps us because it's not flat, we'll go back and forth. You'll see exactly where this fibroid is located in terms of the fallopian tube to help to plan out the surgery. How do you get this fibroid out without damaging the local structures? And today we use what they call a hysteroscope. You know, hysters, uterus, and scope. And using a very fine uh, wire loop, you just sort of drag it across. Uh, it's, it's a cautery. And you essentially shave off pieces of this fibroid as you go down and uh, to shave it off until it's removed from the, the muscle of the uterus. Hey doctor, do most um, clinics now, fertility clinics, do they have 3D or is that something that is I exclusive think it's being, to some? Well, it's, it's getting into the community more and more. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a technology that uh, is brought to the community by GE uh, and the technology moves on and uh, you have to stay with the science in, in medicine because it, it moves very quickly. Uh, here's another picture again of the uterus and I'll point this out again. We look at <coughs> shape of the uterus. Uh, generally, you want to see a, a more triangular shape and not this little dip. They call this an arcuate uterus. The uterus actually forms in utero from two tubes in the embryo and they fuse in the midline in the center and that's how you get a, a uterus uh, that's uh, kind of triangular. Here the fusion wasn't complete up at the top and so you see this little dip. There are actually conditions where they'll have two complete cavities, a double uterus. Uh, we have two patients recently that had just one side of the uterus developed. So this allows us to identify those abnormalities and develop an appropriate treatment. So. Doctor, should an ultrasound like this be the very one of the very first things that a woman does when she wants to get pregnant because I'm assuming that there are a lot of people that could go months with problems undetected because they didn't take advantage of the science that is readily available. And I think in fertility centers, that's one of the, the, the most initial tests that is done is an ultrasound to look at the, uh, the uterine shape for any uh, developmental abnormalities, polyps, fibroids, and then it's used in other ways to identify the interior of the uterus. But yeah, that's the, the first start, the starting uh, test, usually the first time the patient comes in. Here's a f the other thing we look at with ultrasound, and certainly this is TD or 2D here, but it's been the most important thing in allowing us to look at what we call ovarian reserve uh, follicle counts. You know, follicle is kind of the house for the egg. 
microscopic egg on the, on the surface of each of these follicles. And you can see by measurements here, uh, they're counting and also measuring the uh, follicles as they develop. Every month, a woman starts with four or five or 15 or 20 follicles out of that group. One emerges as the dominant follicle, releases one egg, and that's why humans ha don't have litters. They just release one egg <laughs> out of the group. Well, some of them look like they have litters. I know. I see a lot of triplets <laughs> around these days. Yeah. <laughs> How many ladies, I'm just curious, I, I, get, I, I know this image quite well. Th this actually could be mine, doctor. I, I, I think that might have been mine um, 20, 2012. Um, how many of you have gone through this? How many of you wanted to grab a post-it note and start marking down the depths and the di diameters for the, see? You, I know what I'm saying right there. <laughs> Being able to track a follicle and how follicles develop and how they mature these microscopic eggs. We can't see the egg, but we can see the follicle. And the follicle size tells us so much about how the maturity is taking place, how many eggs we anticipate uh, we might retrieve um, uh, for IVF or for insemination. So. Doctor, going back to that, just so we have a little bit more knowledge, because I know at first I was always kind of mystified at all of this. Clearly not a follicle is going to come out of every, or not an egg is going to come out of every one of those follicles. If you were to look at that, what would your analysis of that be? Well, this is, looks like a stimulated cycle. Here's one follicle. There may be three here that would have a mature egg. And then these other little smaller ones probably have immature eggs. So this over could release two, maybe three eggs in a given cycle. With in vitro fertilization, this is just one ovary. Uh, hopefully, you could get uh, at least three eggs from that ovary and maybe three from the other side. So. Three is a lucky number, right, right. ladies? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's good. Yeah. In many <laughs> situations, the more the merrier because they don't all fertilize, and not every egg is perfect genetically. So the, many, the more we can get, the more we can fertilize and uh, grow in the laboratory. And uh, how they grow is kind of selects out the best quality. So this is, again, talking about antrophollicle count, and that's what we were talking about. The, the quantity is very important. And now you look at 3D antrophollicle counts, this little color rendition, but you can see how these all follicles are mixed throughout the ovary. Uh, when we do in vitro fertilization, we're placing a needle into the ovary in each of these follicles. We aspirate the fluid, and in the fluid uh, is the microscopic egg. The embryologist then takes those eggs from uh, the fluid. So again, you can see this kind of depth picture. And again, unfortunately, this is kind of decreased follicle reserve where there's only three. And uh, it's so important in terms of uh, helping guiding us how to do an IVF stimulation. Low reserve, you take more stimulation. Higher reserve, less stimulation. We're trying to do much more lower dose today. So here's follicles that start out, they're 10 or 11 millimeters. The, these are all immature follicles. And then as they grow with stimulation, you start to see these larger sizes. And then as we get towards the end, uh, you get these big follicles with ripe eggs. So. Doctor, those big, when the follicles are that large, how really big are they? Are they still microscopic in, in, the, in the real world? <laughs> well, they're, mean, they're about uh, two centimeters. You see, oh, really? Uh, okay, so they the would two, be? Two diameters, 1.5 and 2.3. So this largest one is just about like that. Oh, okay. And you can see that on ultrasound when we do, uh, uh, you know, this is magnified, but you'll see the, the needle come into the field and we go into a follicle. The follicle collapses down as we take the fluid. And then we pass that fluid to the embryologist in the lab, and they take the eggs from the fluid. Wow. So you'll get uh, you know, maybe a quarter of a teaspoon from a large follicle like that. So, so ultrasound is really. Can, can I blame my bloating on that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but ultrasound, again, uh, in this, we do some 3D and uh, looking at ovaries and, and helping us to estimate how we would do the stimulation. Uh, to make it safer than it has been before uh, so we don't overstimulate the patients that have a lot of uh, reserve follicles. But before we had ultrasound, we were kind of guessing how to stimulate ovaries, and now it's much safer and much more effective. So, so fibroids, this is probably the area that 3D ultrasound has been most helpful. Uh, we know that fibroids are very common. 25 to 50 percent of women may have some. And they can develop it within the uterine wall, the muscle part. We don't worry about that too much. Uh, if they're on the outside of the uterus, they don't affect fertility uh, too often as long as they're not very large, maybe five or six centimeters. But if it distorts the cavity, that creates problems with implantation and possible miscarriage. So 
3D has been very helpful in allowing us to identify, here's a uterine cavity, and you see this fibroid is beginning to bulge into the cavity. Now this particular test is called a saline infusion sonohistogram, and this is probably the most important advanced uh, testing that has been uh, made possible by 3D, is that when you put the fluid in, it opens up the cavity, you can see exactly the size, the position, and how you would plan a surgery to remove that fibroid. Uh, the fluid uh, saline is put through the cervix, a little bit of cramping, but most of the time it's a pretty comfortable test. But you're able to scan up and down through the cavity, up and down through the wall, and really identify the location and the presence of this fibroid and uh, whether it uh, needs to be removed before you go on to transfer embryos. Doctor, what is the easiest way to remove a fibroid? Does all of it have to be surgically removed, or can sometimes well, they shrink down? Well, not necessarily. Down? Again, it, when we look inside the uterus with this little telescope, mm -hmm. and we, we shave the fibroid down to the surface, sometimes the fibroid extends into the wall, and 3D helps us to see how deeply it is to the wall, uh, how far we have to go. Sometimes we have to leave some of it because it's going all the way through the walls. Is there any way a woman, is there anything a woman can do to prevent a fibroid? Not that we know of. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the genes. Really? It's in the genes. It is so common. Uh, again, small fibroids, uh, we don't worry about. It's the ones that really distort the cavity that create the problems with fertility. Um, and this is the other condition. Again, a 3D ultrasound. You can see this is the uterine muscle here, and this is the cavity of the uterus. And you see this little bright spot here with uh, a lot of echoes. This is what they call a polyp. Now, a polyp is just an overgrowth of the lining of the uterus. It's very common. But again, if you're going to transfer an embryo into the uterus, you want to run into the polyp. You know, it can create some bleeding. Uh, if you are trying to get pregnant on without in vitro fertilization, uh, this, again, is a saline salt uh, histogram where we've opened up the cavity. But this polyp actually is, is sitting right in the middle of the cavity and it's rubbing on the opposite wall, which you can see here on 2D. On 2D, you kind of see it's there, and maybe that's just a thick wall. But now with 3D, it's very clear that that's oh, a Oh, so the left is 2D. So that's right. what a normal, just what, and the 3D, that, that's amazing. That's right. I mean, it goes from just being a white blob to something that you can really right. identify. Can you even see the polyp on the Well, 2D? I can, but I, <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> that's it's why he's of, the doctor, sort of right clearly. <laughs> 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 When you start looking to, but here, you know, you can't miss that. It's kind of smiling at you. Yeah. See a little smile? You know? <laughs> it says, come and get me. <laughs> All right. And again, this is other, uh, looking at the shape of the uterus, how nicely it's outlined on 3D. You've got a lot of echoes. Again, you can see this little polyp here. And it helps us to identify anatomic uh, conditions that may interfere with fertility. And this is actually a hysteroscopic picture where we're looking with a telescope and you can see the uterus and the, the opening of the fallopian tubes and uh, the polyp doesn't show up very well here, but it's, uh, it allows us to plan and to anticipate what we would see when we uh, look into the uterus with the hysteroscope. So. And here's a little better picture of a polyp. So. Embryo transfer. Uh, again, when you transfer embryos into the uterus, you want to be able to anticipate uh, curves, <laughs> um, whether the uterus is tilted forward or backwards, and uh, 3D ultrasound will help you in that way. And certainly for uterine uh, uh, malformations, it may give you a little bit of a guide. You know, here's the uterus. I know the bladder is full. You can't really see that, but this is how we would look at the uh, plan out for a transfer of embryos, and you can actually measure the distance. I know that's a lot of uh, shades of gray there, but it's <laughs> we know what it is. <laughs> okay. Doctor, though, one interesting thing, though, like you said, with the comparison from the 2D to the 3D, clearly you as the doctor knew exactly, but I think there's such a great benefit for a patient, a woman who's going through this, to just have a better understanding, to be able to see through our own eyes what the doctor is talking about. Would you ladies agree that this 3D technology makes, I guess to a degree, makes you feel a little bit more empowered because you understand more? And I, I think that that has an intrinsic value as well in the, in the yeah. field of fertility. You know, visuals are very helpful in trying to understand a very complicated process. And 
I'll just, uh, I think we're kind of towards the end here and then we can talk. And uh, mm -hmm. again, it's uh, the ability to, to visualize, uh, not just the doctor, but for the patient to understand uh, what conditions they may or may not have and, and how best to move forward with their treatments. Doctor, are you amazed too at just how far technology has come since you started? What? I know you're such a young man. You're in your 30s now, right? That's right. <laughs> and it's hard to imagine where, we, where the next step is going to be in the next five to ten years. Uh, um, the technology in medicine is multiplying as we speech, speak. <laughs> uh, genetics is going to be such a big part of how we move forward with uh, treating patients in the future. Um, but the, the visual technology will continue to improve as the software and the hardware gets better and better, uh, we're probably just scratching the surface. So. Do you think it's an important question when someone is looking for a, a clinic, a reproductive center to go to, to ask that question going in, do you have 3D technology? Do you think that speaks volumes to who you're working with? I think so, but I, I think most of the big clinics now rely heavily on 3D because it gives you the saline sonogram is such a wonderful test in terms mm -hmm. of looking at the uterus and planning the surgeries. And what's the difference between 3D and 4D? Is it the same machine, just different Yeah, approaches? it's it's real time. Uh, we'll use it with embryo transfers where you can actually see the catheter move. I didn't really show you any 4D. We didn't have uh, clips of that, but it's, uh, it's sort of the next step where you can look at uh, how a catheter moves into the uterus. Um, where do you think it will go, say, in, in 10 years, if you, had the, if you had the 3D, 4D crystal ball in front of you? <laughs> I think you're probably going to have it in your home. Really? You can probably scan your abdomen and... Uh, <laughs> that polyp's smiling at me. <laughs> Get it right. out. <laughs> and you'll be able to scan and uh, send it to your doctor and uh, look at your follicle as it grows uh, through the cycle. You really think that's Certainly. around the corner? Absolutely. You know, one thing, too. Uh, Are we ready for that? <laughs> <laughs> the DIY kits. You can just send those right out. One thing, too, uh, and I have to say, especially with my relationship with you and, and uh, Southern California Reproductive Center, the technicians that you have in there conducting the ultrasounds, you develop a really close relationship with these women. I mean, close for various reasons because but 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 it's amazing too that they're they're there with you it almost feels like sometimes the girls in the back are my cheerleaders with that oh that's a good one oh <laughs> have you guys had that experience as well how important that part is because that really does become sort of the the the, the cycle i guess well that's part of the visual when you go in for the ultrasound and uh being able to see the follicles grow or see the fibroid was there and now it isn't uh you know, like I say, visuals are really important for when we're a patient. So. Uh, we wanted to uh, kind of share a little bit more about why I am here as well, other than I do love to moderate. I like a microphone and a live audience, but that all goes without saying. Um, I met Dr. Danzer really, I think, what, maybe almost four years ago now. It seems like that. Uh, I was just turning 40. And, you know, I got the memo I, a little late that maybe it would be time to have a child. Uh, I was in denial probably about my age, and I read the covers of People magazine, and I saw 40-year-old women having twins all the time. So I thought, sure, why not? It seems everybody's doing it. So I did a four-part series for KTLA News, where I work as the morning anchor, on 40 and fertility. Now, this wasn't, you know, I mean, I'm not the first reporter to do it, but I was one of the first, at least in this market, to openly talk about it being my story. And one thing that I was really advocating in that piece at the time was for women to monitor their FSH levels as they were aging to see where they were, you know, and just because that is a good guide as one is getting older to see where your count is. And it's such an easy test that you, I, to me, I think it should be required anytime you go in for a pap smear. It just seems like that should be just an obvious, let's see those numbers. Because if your numbers get too high, that can scare you. So <laughs> already the tests have changed. That was FSH really? and now it's AMH. Oh, it is? Yeah, see, so I'm like, what's AMH? Well, it's anti-malarian hormone. And it's actually, FSHs tend to go up and down from cycle uh -huh. to cycle. AMH is, is more uh, constant. Oh, you really? can even measure it on birth control pills. And it's, uh, again, a blood test. It mm -hmm. looks at this protein that's made by all the resting follicles in the ovary. And actually is a better indicator of the, of the total reserve of the ovary. Oh, really? So the technology marches on. 
Sounds like I need to do a new four-part series on that. Yeah. Moving on. Well, anyway, so I went through that, and then, of course, you know, I had other things to do on the long list of things to do. And then finally I got serious about things when I was about 42. Of course, Dr. Dancer was one of my experts who appeared on our story for KTLA. Uh, and then I decided, well, let's get serious about it, and I went full steam ahead. I was just going to manipulate this situation. I was going to take control. Don't any of you ever have that feeling? I can handle this. I will put it on my to-do list, and I'll get it done. So the first thing I did was a round of in vitro fertilization. <laughs> I didn't try Clomid. I didn't try anything. I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do, do it one time, one shot, probably have twins. Everything's going to be great. OK, that didn't work. <laughs> but God bless Dr. Dancer. He was right there. He was right there with me. So after that, you and I really discussed, because at the time I was 42, 43, that in vitro, although can be very successful, there is a cost figure to consider. But more importantly for me, we were dealing with older eggs. And in vitro, a round of in vitro didn't make my eggs any younger, did it? No. <laughs> he was just we able. Just more. You just got more, more older right. eggs. <laughs> so for the better part of, I guess, probably a year, year and a half, I did Clomid and various other drugs and injections, and we tried things the old-fashioned way. I was just hoping that there was still one good egg left. I would sit there every month and I'd go, would the good egg please come forward? <laughs> I still believe the good egg might be in there, but it's really hiding and it's really, really stubborn. So um, we went through that for like for quite a while, but I was lucky in the fact that my ultrasounds, 2D and 3D, we didn't have really any, any real issues. Right. I think the uterus was fine. Uh, you had a fairly decent reserve, you know, that's, that's, you got to find the good egg, and unfortunately it's one in 20 or 30 as you're going into the 40s, and uh, whether it's uh, with IVF or with stimulation cycles, you're really looking for the good egg. We never found that good egg. <laughs> that good <laughs> egg is still, <laughs> <Yet>. <laughs> that good egg yeah. is still hiding, but one of the things I became so familiar with this ultrasound, and of course we did 2D most of the time, but it, it can be, Let's just talk about openly, and all of you, everyone here pretty much has gone through an ultrasound, am I right in that, except probably you men? <laughs> but you can get so excited and optimistic when you see, oh, that's a 21, or that's a 17, and you start counting the numbers, and you start, it, it's, it, it, you, it is a numbers game, but it can be an emotional, that part can be an emotional roller coaster as well. The whole process is emotional, <laughs> and it's, it just sort of ramps up as you go through as your follicles enlarge, mm -hmm. and you count the numbers, absolutely. Did you ladies feel that way when you'd have those cycles that would just be, I mean, you know, I, I, would, I would even sometimes take the picture home and go, this is the one, and uh, well, it didn't, it didn't happen. So um, I have exciting news, and of course Dr. Dancer knows, and I'd love to share this, and I've decided to make this a very open conversation. I turned uh, 45 a couple of weeks ago. And so I realized, dig, well, yeah. thank you very much, doctor. I realized, too, that as, as much as I wanted and I willed it and I just prayed and did all the things, drank the tea, did the acupuncture, you know, the odds, just the statistical odds of having a healthy baby at 45 with my own egg wasn't going to happen. And, you know, the risk of miscarrying would be so incredibly high. It took me a long time to actually just have that conversation with myself where I really came to the facts, but this wonderful man, this doctor, reminded me that even though my eggs were old, the uterus was looking okay. Yeah, the uterus <laughs> didn't have much age effect. And that's the thing that sometimes I think many people who are on the outside, I mean, this is a pretty experienced audience and an educated audience, we, we don't realize that, that the eggs could be problem problematic, but yet we as women have the potential to carry a child well past the time when our eggs have, when that egg timer has expired, so to speak. Right. Exactly. Because the lining of the uterus builds up every month, breaks down with the period, then starts brand new again. So there's no real age effect on the uterus up till probably 50 something. 50. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, it's the ovary that is born with the eggs that it uh, has and that it diminishes uh, those over time. But the, the uterus is brand right. new every month. Pretty much like sperm counts are brand new every month. So. No, don't let's not even get started okay, on that. Right, those right, those right, darn right. men. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the conclusion of the story, or at least the conclusion of this chapter. I realized that I have a, thanks to some ultrasound technology, a uterus that could easily carry a child. And we were we had learned too that my lining every month seemed to be right. seemed to be good. And there was no polyps and there's no fibroids, so then you can go ahead with transferring embryos to the uterus. Okay, so I had the uterus. 
I have a six foot five fiance and apparently he's got no issues. His sperm was just <laughs> fine. So the only issue was my egg, my egg. So I came to Dr. Danzer shortly after my birthday and I said to him, okay, let's talk about this donor egg thing. Because I think as you begin the process, you start at that point, you go, it's only going to be my egg and my partner's sperm and I'm gonna carry the baby and that's it and we're gonna do everything. And then you go on the journey and one of those things or two of those things or three of those things don't work and then all of a sudden you start to entertain the other possible ideas that went along. So you and I spoke about the options and there are many. I, I like to say that looking for an egg donor is sort of like a weird online dating experience. <laughs> <laughs> But you suggested for a woman of my age that I look at my egg bank, and we're looking at, uh, we, we opted to look at frozen eggs, and I'll let Dr. Dancer explain, explain why. Egg banking now is uh, on the horizon. Uh, there's several large uh, frozen egg banks. Uh, again, these banks have uh, recruited uh, egg donors that have been successful in the past, uh, they're stimulated, they've had a good pregnancy history, and they freeze the eggs. The f egg freezing technology is at a point where it's almost as good as fresh eggs, so that you can go to the egg bank and look at the profiles and the characteristics of the donors and select a, a good match. Mm -hmm. And usually they uh, send you six eggs, and out of that group of six, we'll grow them for five days, and by day five with a 100 cell embryo, you get one, sometimes two high quality embryos. Uh, just last week, uh, a couple that had um, six eggs, uh, five fertilized, and they actually uh, had four that had progressed on to the uh, day five, and they transferred one, I think froze three. That's the exception, but that kind of lets you know how good egg freezing technology is advanced. Uh, it wasn't a few years ago that uh, egg freezing was very poor. The egg is the largest cell in the body, and you have to dehydrate a cell before you can freeze it. You've got to pull all the water out, shrink it down. And it just, uh, uh, the technology got to the point that uh, they will do that very well, and so now egg banks are available. It's about half of the cost mm -hmm. of trying to stimulate a donor. Uh, you don't have to worry about 10 embryos sitting in a bank someplace once you've gotten pregnant with your your one embryo, so. And, and I'll say why, cost was a real big, you know, it, it was a real big consideration. I mean, after, you know, a round of IVF, and again, I only did one round, but months and months and months of a, a Clomid or an injection here or a Lupron shot here, whatever you're doing, you know, I did. I stopped adding up the receipts after a while because it was just, <laughs> it was just too hard. I, I don't, and I don't count that high either. So I stopped, <laughs> I stopped at one point. But the other thing, and Dr. Danzer and I talked about this, Using a fresh donor, you know, you do have the cycle situation where, you, you know, you've got to pick and then they've got to go through the whole round and, and all of that. And you're right, with a fresh donor, this young woman could come out with, you know, 18, 19, 20 eggs. I don't need 18, 19, 20 eggs. Yeah, I think the studies are pretty clear that with one high-quality embryo day five, whether it's fresh or frozen, the pregnancy rate's in that kind of 50 to 60% range. Now again, you usually don't have, maybe half the time you have embryos to freeze with a, a frozen egg, whereas with a fresh stimulated donor, you're gonna have uh, three or four embryos to freeze most of the time. So you don't have that fallback. So. Can I tell you one thing too that I think is really interesting? Seldom, seldom in this world of fertility is there anything called a money back guarantee. <laughs> But my egg bank, uh, the one that we use in Atlanta, not only do they do some preliminary screenings of the eggs, there I got a medical report about certain things that markers that they could look at. So I think it was cystic fibrosis and a couple of things that they were able to check. But for some reason, if those eggs come, and in the next couple of weeks when we fertilize them with my partner's sperm, if the eggs for whatever reason are faulty or there's some sort of genetic defect in them, you get six more eggs. You do. I mean, I mean, it doesn't ha have to happen very often, but I thought that's that right. that is a really, in a world that is so uncertain, that just was one other level of, okay, so if for whatever reason that doesn't, you know, that doesn't work. Um, so back to the weird online dating experience. So I'm on, I'm on the website and very similar to, very similar to anything else you, you know, click on and you look at all these sort of things. And of course, you know, I'm Caucasian, so I went along those lines. Uh, my partner is six foot five. I'm rather tall. Uh, so I saw a young woman. Um, she was 22, and she was 5'11". So, you know, you know, 
I mean, if we're going to have a child, it might as well be a superstar athlete or a professional model. I mean, one of the two. I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to engineer it this much. She'll be playing down the UCLA <laughs> exactly, field. There. Exactly, exactly. Right. Um, so I looked at it, and, you know, I, I think so many of us, you look for something that is certain. You're looking for that one sign, especially when you start, uh, and for lack of a better term, but manipulating things, when you start using donor eggs or you look at other options. So I, through this whole process, I've been looking for some sort of certainty, something that would tell me that this was the right thing to do. So many of you know that I am a news reporter, and I have been that my entire life. Uh, but one other thing that I do, too, for the last decade of my life, and I think I, this was sort of like I didn't have a child, so I started doing other things. I started in a nonprofit foundation called the Good News Foundation here in Los Angeles, and we give back to smaller nonprofits. So it's really become my passion. My, my, I'm a good news girl. That's my passion. So I read her profile, and on my egg bank, you get to see their profile, and they also give you a baby picture, which I like, too, because let's be honest. If someone asks, if I was to be an egg donor, let's say, and someone looked at my adult picture, and they go, oh, that'd be great. I'll, she'll look like her. I'm like, this is not my hair color. This is not my nose. These are not my boobs. <laughs> I am false advertising the whole way around. But the baby picture was a great idea because you can really, you know, see what they look like as a child. And I think that was so great. So um, even before I looked at the baby picture, though, I went down and I read, you know, she was 22 and, and she liked dogs and, you know, all the things that you would normally see. And then she's in her third year of college and she is studying to be a broadcast journalist. And then I went down a little bit further, and she liked Frank Sinatra, and she likes to travel, and she likes Pilates. I'm like, I like Pilates, too. Um, and then I got to the bottom, and it said that um, her life ambition was to one day run a nonprofit organization. It was the one. So I read one thing that she said, and this will always ring true, too. Um, it said that, you know, what your life goals are, too. And she said, you know, I'm highly motivated. You know, I want to achieve my goals, and I want to do so no matter what the cost. And I realized that that was me 25 years ago. I want to have my goals. I want to work in Los Angeles. I want to do it no matter what the cost. But the cost was I let too much time go by, and I wasn't able to have a child with my own egg. But you know what? I'm going to have a baby. And I think yeah, we're going to have a baby, right? We're sure. going to have a baby. That's right. And that's your family. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that I wanted to do, and Dr. Danzer knows this as well, is I really did want to speak openly about the use of a donor egg because I do not believe that there is any shame in that. And unfortunately, when people don't talk about secrets, that secret has the connotation of having shame. This is not a secret. This is my decision. My decision has no shame. And no woman should ever feel shameful or feel that she has to be secretive about a choice. And especially a choice that's that important about motherhood. So, so there you have it. I think we only give those secrets power when we keep them as a secret. So let it be known. Plus, I also believe in good karma. So if all of you, what, three weeks, two, two weeks, three weeks, are we going to do this? Probably. No, we're close. But this is just pre-hormonal stuff. This is just a <laughs> warm-up to what's going to happen. Uh, ironically, this was strange, so we decided to do it. Um, I, I spent $500 on shipping and handling for the eggs to come from Atlanta. <laughs> I told Dr. Danzer, if they arrive at SCRC in an igloo cooler, I'm going to be very upset. I want a whole cryogenic tank or something. You know, I want, like, you know, I want it. <laughs> so I think they arrived. I think they're actually there. I have to say hello to them. <laughs> I think I'm going to just go by and visit. And then you, yeah, you put me on birth control, though. I, I always find that to be counterintuitive in some ways. Tell me, tell me why I'm, I'm doing that again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's really to prepare the line of the uterus. Mm -hmm. know, the birth control pills suppress the hormone, get the line of the uterus very thin, which we'll see on ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And then again, as you take the estrogen to build the lining, uh, that prepares for the implantation process. Mm -hmm. And again, on ultrasound, we'll look at the development of the line of the uterus. It goes from five millimeters up to eight or nine or 10. Mm -hmm. And when the line of the uterus, after about 10 or 12 days, is where it would be in a close to ovulation uh, size, uh, then you add the progesterone, and that's when these eggs are then thawed, and they're fertilized, and then f after five days of growth, then the embryo is transferred into the uterus. 
So you put them back into me. That's right. So the thing is, I don't have to sync up with a fresh donor. This is just all on my time, on my schedule, right. on my cycle, which is which is very nice. You know, you kind of feel like you have a little bit more control. So we're excited. Right. Yeah. We're very excited. Oh, and the other thing too, I thought for sure I was gonna have to prepare for like a whole round of you know that pharmacy. Every time I walk into Roxanne Pharmacy, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but. We're not trying to stimulate anything. Yeah, what, what, maybe some estradrill, something? I mean. It's usually oral estrogen, which is inexpensive, and then uh, progesterone afterwards, which luckily is not very expensive. So, th a lot of the cost of the stimulation you don't have to assume. And also, the, we try to keep the hormone levels in a more physiologic range. Well, that's going to be impossible with me, but we can try. <laughs> <Sweet>. <laughs> no, but I think that's, you know, too, having month after month of going in, and you know what I'm talking about, ladies, pharmacy bills that are $800, $900, $1,500 $1, to go in and get a prescription of estradiol and have the woman say, that will be $19, and tears come down my eyes. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So it, it's just... It's nice to come to this journey. So, look, we all have our own journeys and our own paths and our own twists and turns and quarters and bumps. But, um, again, I just wanted to tell all of you that, you know, you just find the path that's best for you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Tune in in the morning and... Uh, Yeah, you know, I think I think for the most part, I, my my close circle knows, like my, my friends know that I'm doing this. Uh, you know, I, I tell them, you know, it's a couple months uh, or a couple weeks away. Um, it's a weird thing though, because like any pregnancy, you don't want to get it out too much. But I think I'm I'm very excited because, what what are my odds, doctor, of having a baby right now on my own, at 45, with my own egg? Well, per cycle. Per cycle, per month, it's, it's less than 1%. Yeah, okay, less uh, than 1. Yeah. So I'm going from less than 1 to, and let's be optimistic. 50 to 60%, maybe 65. 65? I'm yeah. hearing 70. He said yeah, 65. Yeah. I heard 70. <laughs> Did anyone else hear 70? Because that's what I heard. Clearly, it was 70%. Yeah, and the thing that I'm so excited about as well is my miscarriage rate, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I spend yeah. a lot of time not in your office on the Internet. My miscarriage rate is based on the 22-year-old's eggs, right. not my 45-year-old age. Yeah. So it's it's almost single digit, it's 10 or 12 percent, as opposed to 40 percent or 50 percent. How about those numbers? Yeah. How about them numbers? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I am going to talk about it. I, I'm going to record some of it. I don't know if you know this, but I, I want to bring it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I want to bring a camera, you know, in like my own camera, my own HD camera, so then I have it as a resource or a diary. It might be just a blog. It might just be something I do that way, which I think is, you know, some person. It's personal, and I think it has kind of a more. It's it's funny. A blog can can last for years and be circulated, where a television story sometimes has that one hit and might go away. So we'll we'll figure that. You had a question. Do you have to go through uh, legal paperwork or anything like that with the egg donor versus what you would have done with like a fresh? Mm -mm. No. No, I just had to give them my credit card number. I didn't even have to, <laughs> honestly, I didn't have to fill out a credit card authorization form. I mean, the lady in Atlanta was like, I was driving in the car, we were talking back and forth, and I'm like, I'd selected my lot, so I basically had reserved that. And again, the one and only profile I looked at and um, I said, well, I guess the next step is payment. I said, do you need to, I need to fax you something. She goes, well, you can just read the credit card number to me over the phone if you want. <laughs> and I went, okay. <laughs> so no, that, that's just, it's just that. $10,000 for the eggs, flat fee for six eggs, versus a fresh donor. I did some research in Los Angeles. It's close to 25. I think it's closer to 30, agencies, 35. Agencies, medication, contracts, yeah. It's, it's because in that point, you do have a contract. You do have to pay for the whole in vitro cycle of the person who's donating. Um, yeah, so you have to pay for that. You have to sync up their cycle, your cycle with her cycle. Right. You have the legal papers. Then there's the agency fee, and then, of course, that donor gets a fee. Right. So my donor could have had 20, 25 eggs. They could have split them up. Is that, I mean? Right. Yeah. Sure. You know what I'm hoping, though, for this donor? I am hoping, and I was reading one of the big advocates of frozen eggs, said that the greatest college gift any father, any parent could give their daughter is to freeze her eggs when she graduates from college. Interesting. 
<laughs> and I thought about that. I'm like this this wonderful woman who I'm you know have have her eggs or you know you have her eggs basically, but I'm soon they're going to be right in late. Um, she um, she um, has given me something. I really hope that she said, "Hey, can I have six of those eggs?" For me, I, I, I'm hoping that they do that for the donors. I don't know if they do, but I'm hoping that they give them an option to freeze while they go through the cycle. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I think, I don't want to get too much on frozen eggs, but I mean, that that's the next technology. I think fresh donors will probably be a thing of the past in the next few years. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. <laughs> yes. I had a couple questions. I was taking notes. Uh, this is the first I've heard of... Um, Sorry, look at my nose. AMH, is this going to be? Is this commonplace? Is this already? Is it? Is the following of AMH already going on in fertility clinics right now, or is this a newer thing? Yeah, it's. I think the the standardization of the test last couple of years. I mean, it's uh, it's it's really replacing FSH now. It's a more accurate test, and young women can get it from their gynecologist uh, when they have their Pap smear when they're 30 or 32. There are some women in their early 30s who begin to <laughs> see a lowering of the AMH. This which is a reflection of the of the whole store of thousands of eggs in the ovaries. So uh, that technology is, is re improving. And again, how to move those women that may begin to diminish their reserve in their <coughs> early to mid 30s to l let them see that you know they're the ones that should uh, do the egg freezing for sure. Yeah, I, mean, I think it should be. I think every gynecologist should make that a mandatory test every year for anyone who comes in. That's my soapbox. Hope for the future. Yes. Yeah. Also, the egg banks um, are you, now. The egg banks are they going to start being used, or are they being used for donors on a regular basis? Or, for instance, are you are you finding donors and using them in t and intending to use those eggs for the egg banks, or do you still only use donors when you have someone who wants eggs from that donor? Well, the egg banks uh, recruit a donor that they inform that they're going to stimulate and retrieve their eggs, and those eggs may go to several different recipients. Oh, I see. So the egg donors the are egg bank, from the banks, yeah. then not from the not from the fertility clinics. From my egg bank in particular, they're in Atlanta. They're one of the leading groups, but they say that they recruit at college campuses. They will advertise in college papers. Okay. They run th the the young women run through a myriad of tests. I think they usually get about five thousand dollars from what I from what I gathered, and all their medications are paid for. And then they go central, and then my egg bank works selectively with probably only about 20, 25 clinics throughout the country. And I am very lucky that the Southern Re California Reproductive Center has a relationship with that egg bank. So that's how the relationship happened. I think we're out of time for official questions with the panel, but hopefully uh, Wendy and uh, Dr. Danza are around afterwards and could answer if you have some personal questions. But I really just wanted to thank uh, Wendy Birch for sharing her personal and inspiring story and Dr. Hal Danza for his expertise. And I uh, encourage you all, if you're tweeting or doing all this social media stuff, to keep up the conversation. And if you guys have any closing comments. Baby. <laughs> yeah, and we'll all be following Wendy, <laughs> Wendy's news and, and wishing for good karma. Thank you very much. Yes, that's so. right. That's, thank you. Good karma, good doctor. I'll be fine.